Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for attending this um, Active Learning Academy uh, series. This is the second in a series of presentations related to the Active Learning Academy. Uh, and today we have Meredith Troutman Jordan, Barbara Knight, and Mandy Carter, who will be speaking about flipped classroom in three um, formats. And if you want, just participate in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and can help interject if we need. Uh, to pop any questions in, but it uh, looks like it'll be a lively session. So I look forward to, to hearing the speaker speak. Are you ready for me to share now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. We create, <laughs> thanks all for your interest in our presentation. And we created a brief um, vi uh, set of slides just to give you a visual in addition to the things that we're talking about and just to see some of our examples. We've also organized this because it, it just so happened nicely that we the exam the exemplar courses we wanted to share with you are online completely we have one hybrid course and one in class uh, standard campus based classroom example to share so that's kind of how we structured the uh things we wanted to share with you today i'm going to share my slides Let's see can, can you all see that we can't see them yet you cannot cannot okay let me try this again There we go. Uh, all right, great. There so as we said, our title is Flipped Classrooms in Three Formats, Online, Hybrid, and In-Person. And to make sure we're achieving the uh, things we hope to impart to you, our objectives are to describe various strategies implemented in classrooms via three modalities, in-person, hybrid, and online. Secondly, we want to discuss the kind of content and materials that we've utilized across these three flipped classroom settings. And lastly, we want to evaluate student uptake in class performance and achievement of learning outcomes in the three classroom settings. So um, if one of my colleagues would like to introduce flipped classrooms, they can, or I can do that as well. Silence. <laughs> By all means, colleagues, Ch chime in Mandy and Barbara, uh, but we started with looking at a definition of flipped classroom, which is an instructional strategy and a type of blended learning. The intent is to increase student engagement and learning by having students complete readings and various activities, homework at home, uh, and then they use the time that they're in class, whether it be online, in camp, on campus, or some very some combination of those two. They do active problem solving and creating of various products, educational products during this class time. So some of the, the thinking behind or the rationale behind flipped classrooms is that it shifts activities, including traditionally considered homework into the classroom. So they're actively learning uh, and they watch online lectures they collaborate in online discussions or there's other activities that they complete at home while they're actively engaging in the concepts in the classroom. And as the instructor, we provide guidance and redirection as needed. So these are our examples. Uh, we've organized them according to um, extent of online versus in-person delivery. So starting with the online classroom, and I believe that was Mandy's part. Do you wanna share with us your um, experiences? Sure, hi everybody. My name is Mandy Carter and I am an adjunct in the um, communication studies department. And uh, I've been with UNC Charlotte since 2016, but this is the first semester that I've taught completely online asynchronously. Um, so it's a it's a bit different for me uh, this semester. I'm teaching media law, which is kind of a content, um, you know, substantive content class, and then a debate class, which is skills based learning. And um, so I've been trying to incorporate flipped learning into the uh, debate class this semester, and it's a little bit different because the class is asynchronous in nature, which is. A lot of what flipped learning is, is recording lectures that the students review outside of class so that in class you can get into um, more of a deep dive with the exercises and examples. And so um, since the lectures that I do are asynchronous and pre-recorded, um, you know, I've kind of have flipped learning built into it, but the way that I have been able to still monitor students um, I guess, in, internalization of the skills and, and see how they're doing before I'm asking them to actually deliver and perform a full debate is I'm turning kind of this, the flipped classroom um, idea um, into 
the weekly discussion board assignments that I have for the students. I know sometimes with asynchronous classes, the discussion boards can often seem like a check the box type of uh, component of the class where you have the students um, you know, answer a question or respond to a question. But, but what I'm doing is I'm requiring the students to, um, of course, view the lecture content for that week, but each week they are performing out and delivering out um, a video of a skill that is that week's focus. Um, so it's it's kind of the discussion boards take the place of what a face-to-face -face class would, um, I guess, so to speak, because the students are creating their videos, uploading those videos. I'm providing feedback on those videos in the discussion board, and um, the students are providing feedback on their classmates as well. So we're, we're building in the practice that way, um, and I'm able to see, you know, are they actually watching the content and then kind of... Um, you know, through, in a sense, a scaffold approach, are they able to kind of build and layer the skills as I introduce them week to week? So I feel like um, this is a really good um, use of kind of the flipped learning uh, concept in this asynchronous environment. I feel like I have a bit more connection with the students than I do in my other substantive um, content class where it really is, in a sense, kind of a, a, a more traditional um, asynchronous delivery um, format. And um, they're able to get the feedback from me kind of real time as they're learning the skills and also the feedback from each other. Um, and with the videos, deliveries um, on the discussion board, the students are able to see and check in with their classmates to see how um, their skills are progressing, um, ultimately to have a, um, you know, a, a more polished uh, full deliverable at the end of the semester. So that's one way that I've been incorporating this flipped learning environment into an already flipped uh, concept with the asynchronous um, lectures. Uh, so I think the question is, how are we doing the videos? Um, I record my videos for my lectures either through Zoom or through Kaltura. It just depends on which one I want to use um, to pre-record. But the students themselves upload their videos in the discussion board. Then I also use Padlet as an external tool. Um, it's a free resource, um, but I've uh, really liked the um, discussion board video format. The students seem to like that it's kind of self-contained within Canvas. Um, so that's worked well um, this semester. The Padlet kind of is, is a little bit different um, and it's also very intuitive, easy to, to learn uh, type of platform there. Uh, I think there's another question. How do I respond to each student in the discussion board? So I've responded a couple of different ways. Um, sometimes it's just through text or sometimes I'll email the student directly if I have some um, feedback that I don't necessarily want everyone in the class to be able to see for that particular student. Sometimes I'll upload a video directly to them as well. Um, Padlet is the same. You can upload a video comment or textual comment back to the students. Um, and uh, that for us, the Canvas videos have worked well in the discussion board. Um, so it's come, uh, I can do it both ways. And then also, as I see the discussion boards, I'm able to kind of tailor the next week's discussion to see where are their weak spots, where are they doing well. And so I can kind of pace the remaining um, skills as we're unfolding them to build towards our, our larger debate. Um, and so it's been really beneficial that way too, to be able to see them in real time, like I would in a traditional classroom environment um, in this online format. So that's how this has been working for me. Did anybody else have any other questions or comments for Mandy? What do they say about this? We'll see, <laughs> I guess, at the end <laughs> of the semester. So far, the feedback's been, been fine. I think Another part of the debate style that we use um, requires partners. And so they're using this as a chance to kind of feel each other out in a, in a way to see, you know, which debate style do I like for my classmates since we're not meeting in the face-to-face -face environment. And so it's hard for them to make those connections otherwise. So it gives them exposure to each other in the class. Um, haven't received any negative comments directly so far. This class is 20 students, so it's a smaller 
um, class. So that's that's a good question there. It would be somewhat difficult to kind of scale out on a larger scale. It would probably cut down on the amount of feedback that you could give directly. Um, but that's really, you could really get the students involved in providing the feedback. You'd have to you know, spot check that as you went along um, if you're trying to scale this out to a larger class size. But this is just for 20 students in this environment. I don't think, I don't think you shared with us, Mandy, was this an undergraduate or graduate course? It's undergraduate, so a 2000 okay. level. Usually it's juniors and seniors in the course. I was asking because in my example, and I'm the hybrid classroom, the first example I gave is students who are undergraduate, and um, I was interested, I'd like to try some of your strategies for the discussion forum, because in my um, instance, and this is, I've seen this repeatedly over different semesters, the students are not as involved as they could be, not as engaged in the discussion forum. And I've typically thought it was because this was a hybrid course and there was the opportunity because the, in this in this course, this is a clinical course. So the students have weekly online uh, assignments from videos to um, discussion forums, self quizzes. And I, I feel like I could get more participation, particularly in the discussion forum, but a lot of that discussion occurs that would otherwise occur in the discussion forum when they're with me all day for Wednesday at the hospital. So I don't know that mine participate as much. I don't think they appreciate it for the complete value that it has. Um, they are really responsive to the other um, flipped classroom activities I have, which include, like it says here, they have weekly self tests. And this is just a 10 item quiz on the content that they're doing in their didactic associated course that's that corresponds with this clinical course. So I take that content and I actually use the textbook to create a brief self quiz every week. And interestingly, particularly this year, they have been almost obsessively worried about those darn quizzes. It's just complete or incomplete. It's not for a grade and I have to reinforce to them periodically throughout the semester. This is just to help you prepare for the tests that you will take in class with the associated didactic component that goes with this clinical course. So that's been kind of interesting, but they also have videos which provide some good examples of therapeutic communication techniques, for instance, and this is a psychiatric mental health nursing clinical. So I've got all kinds of videos that depict examples of symptomology that you might see with various uh, psychiatric illnesses. And one of the strengths to including these videos is that you may or may not see that condition in the hospital as whoever happens to be a patient on the unit at that particular week and day when the student is there. So that's one real strength that the videos have offered. And then they can discuss and give feedback, examples of what could have been done better, what, how they would respond to that particular patient on the discussion forum. And those are examples of the questions that they've got for the weekly discussion forum. And there is a discussion forum every week, as well as at least one brief video. And they're usually no more than five minute videos. And there's one self test for each week. Then they um, complete their, the deliverables associated with the clinical performance that they do on the Wednesdays when they're in the classroom, that is the hospital with me, and the online flipped classroom activities is they develop a patient education presentation that they deliver when they're at the hospital. So this preparation and all the data gathering to inform the educational presentation occurs on their own time. A lot of that occurs online as they plan and coordinate because they do these in groups and then they actually implement the education in the hospital. They've really done a nice job with that. They've done a lot of, um, they've used videos to give examples to patients. They have used a lot of, a number of them have used various games, the uh, Jeopardy online, wherever you get that is very popular. I've had a number of groups pick their educational topic and then they actively engage the patients, which is really cool because they're doing what I'm trying to get them to do, which is be actively engaged in the question and answer process. And in the instance of their patient education, they've done things like the importance of hand hygiene, the importance of coping skills, uh, trigger, trigger signs for relapse if, uh, for individuals experiencing addiction, so that's been really nice to see that happen. They also have a nursing care plan that identifies a patient problem and all the um, 
interventions they would implement to try to help that patient with that problem and what their goal is that those interventions strive to achieve, as well as what we call an interpersonal process reporting. For this, they take a conversation they have with the patient and then they document as best they can verbatim that conversation and analyze the therapeutic communication techniques, as well as the, the patient's response as far as interpreting that in the context of whatever their, their diagnosis is. So they submit that online. That's something that they do the preparation and the development of on their own time, again, using a lot of external resources. And this is based on a conversation they have in the clinical setting. Another course in which I've done um, flipped learning, which is the flipped classroom, which is really exciting, is a new course called Gerontology 5050. This was a course that was developed over a relatively short amount of time last summer based on necessity, really, because a colleague and I, who um, she's a faculty emerita, were hoping to do some research um, on use of pet robots by persons with dementia and specifically what kind of therapeutic responses those people had to the use of the pet robots. And so we thought, well, if we could get a graduate student to help us collect this data by interviewing these people, that would be really helpful because we have no funding at present. So we sent out a call and had an overwhelming response to the extent that we said, we don't wanna turn away people who are wanting to learn and be a part of a research team. So we developed it into a special topics course over a period of about a week last summer. Uh, and for this course, there are similar to the Nursing 4420, there's weekly videos, there's readings, they visit external resources on websites, dealing with communication techniques, uh, care of individuals with dementia are some of those examples. And the students also, because we're gonna be helping us with collecting data, they completed the city human subject certification, which includes videos and other external website activities that you're linked to through the city site. Uh, in this particular course, the students are in the field collecting data, doing recruitment for participants, and it's an online course. And we have some ace, we have some synchronous sessions every three weeks. We have all the students meet via Zoom. Tomorrow night is our night, and everyone will where they're going to do practice interviews. So we'll practice what they're going to do when they collect data from their participants in the community. So the deliverables here are students submit logs to tell what they've done what their observations, what they've learned new, how they feel about the things that they're reading and the videos that they're viewing uh, and work with individuals with dementia. They are reporting on uh, recruitment, securing of new sites for research, uh, and they will be submitting transcripts of the interviews that they audio and or video record of the individuals that they are participating in the interviews process with. The other thing that we're really excited and encouraged about is that there's been such demand and popular response to this particular course that we're going to be offering it in the spring. So I think there's a lot of potential for this one. And I think that the flipped classroom has really fit nicely with this particular course because they are doing field work in the form of participant recruitment, site securement, and actual data collection. So that's how I've implemented um, flipped classroom in just two examples of hybrid classrooms. I'm looking to see because I haven't been monitoring the chat. Uh, if I can answer any questions or share any other examples, I'm more than happy to. Um, I'll, I'll continue to monitor the chat, but perhaps Barbara would like to go. I would be happy to. All right. <clears throat> uh, so I'll ask you to flip the, the screen in just a second. Okay. So I'm going to look at a more traditional format. And the perspective I'm going to take is I'm actually teaching um, two sections of freshmen. And this is an introduction to business course. It's very classic topic. These are, um, you know, frankly, kids who have just come in from a year and a half of not having been in the classroom. Um, so this is a very new experience from them. And I'd like to share some of my experiences <clears throat> and look at it from an academic point of view. So Meredith, if you would flip, please. And go to the next one. Okay, <clears throat> so what I've done is I've actually 
gone through the literature. So flipped classroom really came into being, you know, roughly 10 years ago or so around 2010, maybe a couple of years earlier. And there have been updates since. So me being new to the classroom, I wanted to go through the literature and see what the literature was telling me. So I went out and found three fairly significant meta-analyses of the literature over the past 10 years on flipped classrooms to get some insight into really what's happening with flipped classrooms in, a, in this traditional setting. Um, the first area I looked at is what's, what's the outcome? So is this even worth implementing now that I have a chance to start this thing from scratch? And I found that you know, it continues to have a bit of mixed outcome, uh, mixed results in outcomes, but in general, there does seem to be a positive outcomes. So I said, yep, definitely something I wanna go. So then the next question is, okay, how do I wanna do it? So the first thing I did is I went out based on these and I polled my students. Remember, brand new freshmen, business majors coming in for the first time, not having been in the classroom for a while. So I polled them to see how they like to learn best to see if active learning was something that they were even aware of and had interest in. And they did, they, they strongly wanted that. Although I have to say that I had quite a few people who were very much into the lecture thing. So I wanna hear a lecture, I wanna hear notes and a whole other group said, you know, really into videos, love to have demonstrations, like to learn from my peers. So what I did is I built all of those in, but it's based on their preferences. Um, the next thing that came up is um, that students have a hard time remembering in a flip in a in the kind of basic flip classroom what they pre-read once they get in for the activity. So I added a brief in class review and I positioned this as the introduction to the activity. It's my way of reminding them of the content and what they would have pre-read and then really bake it into the activity itself. Okay, if you go to the next slide, please, Meredith. So the next thing I looked at were um, was the current uh, academic research on student perceptions. What do students think? So I got their input on how they think they like to learn. I want to find what the academic research tells me on a much greater scale. So um, in the earlier studies, the 2020 studies, again, we have um, kind of mixed um, information from the academic research. Everything from no effect on student satisfaction, and that's actually an inconsistent result with the outcome result. So they're saying, eh, doesn't really help, but the results are better. So it's, it's an interesting contrast there. Um, and, and the next one is another meta-analysis, a 10-year meta-analysis, weak positive effect um, on their satisfaction. But it's interesting because they use some moderator, moderators and it was moderated by the actual in-class activities, the quality of the activities and the group size and the design sophistication. So what technology was used, what actual activity designs were used. And then um, the method, this last study looked at, compared the three methods, you know, um, <clears throat> the flipped classroom versus online versus just traditional face-to-face -face lecture. And they found minimal impact. So, you know, who knows on the research? I think, I think my conclusion here is that we still have a lot of work to do on the academic research side and this is worth more work. So what I got from it, that and then built into my course design is that I'm designing activities with the best fit to my class population. Now these, are, these aren't even millennials, these are Gen Z folks. These are 18 year olds coming out. So I've designed this with um, really their, their tech background in mind, gaming, simulations. I mean, they've all played Sims. Um, they've all done online gaming. So we use a lot of that built into the activities. I then actually try to vary the group sizes, taking into account the, um, the academic research that group size makes a difference. So we do two things. We do smaller groups for some, 
But then we do larger groups with subgroups for role-playing activities. So we've incorporated all these various activities into the course design. And um, what I'm finding is that there are some limitations in classroom technology that really helps narrow you know, negatively narrows what I can do. I'm in a traditional classroom. We don't even have a whiteboard. I have chalkboards. I and mean, who uses chalkboards anymore? Not me, but you know, we're kind of working through that. If I could have the next slide, please, Meredith. Um, so here are some of the factors that came up in the studies. So as these various studies looked at moderators or factors, here's what they found. And I've this was a slightly older one, um, but it really raises the whole question of pre-work. Um, though this particular study recommended a study hall, so dedicated time or space or recommended place for this pre-work to occur. Um, and what I've done there is I've actually acknowledged the reluctance of students. I mean, number four talks about pre-work reluctance. Frankly, these students are not that into textbooks. And I know this from personal experience from my own kids um, going to school. So I have to design it for people who aren't into reading textbooks, although, you know, it's a fundamental requirement in academia to read textbooks. And I find the textbooks are getting better and e formats significantly help. Um, but I've also given them opportunities to chunk so they can do pieces. I don't assign like whole chapters or multiple chapters. I'll assign chunks. And then I'll mix those chunks up consistent with you know, part activity, part reading. Um, an, an interesting study I found was that this study talked about the optimum number of flip, flip sessions. And this really speaks to what my students told me. They said, you know, some of them like traditional lecture, I like to take notes, I learn from my notes. And other ones said, no, nope, I learned by doing, I learned by seeing, I learned by getting involved. And so I'm mixing those things. So what I've designed is I have kind of half lecture format to cater to those students who are into that and the other half activities. And I break these into separate days so that I'm not mixing the two styles together because that is a problem with time. Um, so what I've also found is that um, this next study that I talk about on student readiness really speaks to the group that I'm talking to. They're not necessarily ready for this mix or this change in formats. So I provide what this study interestingly called scaffolding. So a very specific framework that we work within and I'm learning and they're learning with me. Um, so we try to create together the supporting environment. Um, and so what I've done there is I have um, done very specific and structured activities. And then I do a walk around coaching session. So the instructions are very detailed. They're quite specific. And it really caters to the population that I'm working with. Um, and then I walk around to find out what's going on and to do some uh, real-time coaching as we go. Um, the last point that I want to raise, and it's kind of five and six together, is some of the factors that came up in, in the studies were boring videos, lack of participation, not enough time, um, a poor teacher interaction skills. I kind of talked about how I'm trying to address that with the walk-around coaching. Um, but the boring videos thing I actually found really interesting because when I go to look for videos, one of the places I always end up in my Google search are academic or university videos. And frankly, they're very dry for the most part and they're just not appropriate. So what I've done is I try to pull some of the thoughts out of those and bake them into my lecture. But if I'm gonna show a video, I think, um, um, either Mandy or Meredith. Meredith, I think you mentioned this. You keep your videos around four or five minutes. Yes. That's mine too, because these university-based tend to be much longer. And you know, these students are not going to sit there and watch an hour-long video or a 45-minute yeah. video. So my criteria is it can't be any more than five minutes, and it has to be presented by somebody within a reasonable span of their age group. And it has to be presented in a way that they're going to relate to that materials. 
So I find um, the selection of videos on YouTube are just so good and they're so engaging. And I don't care if the people are a little bit out of bounds. You know, I don't care if they're a little bit edgy. I like that for my students and they're gonna get the points. So that's how I've attempted to do that. The other interesting um, anomaly that was surprising to me is there's a, a mixed level of tech skills. So I am finding that I literally have to give my students click navigation instructions for a lot of these things. I mean, to the point where they don't, they can't find things in a, in a column on, um, canvas very often. So I have to click them through where to go to look. And like I said, that was surprising to me, but they're getting much better at it. And maybe it shouldn't have surprised me because they probably haven't used some of these learning management tools before. Um, but that was an eye opener for me. So um, like I said, I'm very selective on media and I'm still adjusting to getting things down to fit within the class time without them feeling rushed, because that was a feedback that came up in that same study. So that's my presentation. And, um, you know, that's my experience, my limited experience. This is my first time teaching um, as an adjunct. Um, but I hope that I've given you some insight into how the face to face is working there. I have not been looking at the um the questions at all so if anybody has anything they'd like to address i'm happy to review this later and get back to you if anybody if any of the participants want to jump in with any questions this will be a great time for any of us there is a comment i'm looking at from celia in the chat box uh she's just sharing that she addresses tech skills on canvas by walking through the mod through the module on kaltura um if, if, if anybody i i've not um i've had to have it help i haven't created any videos and used culture recently but i can echo uh, barbara's sharing it, it kind of has surprised me because generally the undergraduate students that i work with are the 20 traditional students with an occasional second degree student or a little bit older student there but um i've, I've been surprised and it seems like it kind of comes and goes some semesters i'll have students who really are not as tech savvy as i would have expected them to be um, and other groups, I never get any kind of questions or issues that arise. So that, that's always kind of surprised me when I do have the groups that come up that have difficulties and require that element of extra support. Yeah, Celia, that's that's exactly what I do is what you're suggesting. I literally share my screen and click through with them. That's what I mean by click navigation. Yeah, but it was surprising. It was an eye opener to me. These are um, these are the references if anybody's interested in these specific studies. I've they were all excellent studies, easy to read. I think you'd probably enjoy them. Bobby looks, has a question. Yeah, it looks like we got some questions. Okay, let's see. Should I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, hey, so first of all, thanks to all three of you. Um, we, we need to continue talking um, about this and I wish more of our colleagues were involved um, because there, there are two points that I wanna make here. One, um, regarding the technology piece and Barbara, I was so glad to hear you talk about the use of Kaltura and doing screen captures and voiceovers to kind of walk students through. Um, my experience has been, I've been teaching online since 1990. Um, I know it's hard to believe I, I'm this young looking and, and I've been teaching that long, but it's true. Um, and I have learned one important thing, and that is we can't, by virtue of their birthright, assume that young people know how to use technology and have the technological proficiency that we do. Um, and so I applaud you for thinking about doing that kind of I call it a guided tour or tutorial and kind of a walkthrough because um, one of the mistakes, and, and I made this mistake early on with some research, is asking students prior to coming to your online or hybrid course, have you taken an online course before? And that information, I think we have used that information wrongly because that doesn't tell you what you want to know. That only tells you that they've taken an online course. That doesn't have... I mean, in terms of how they're going to navigate 
your online course, I, you know, there's no guarantee that they're going to know. So your layout can be dramatically different than every other online course they've ever taken or every hybrid course. So not knowing what their experience has been, I think you're, you're very, very smart to create some kind of navigation tour or layout tour at the very beginning of your course, even maybe before, you know, there's no reason why you can't open your Canvas shell a week early and say, look, here's a simple walkthrough. I'm just very, you know, informally talking you through the layout how I've organized content. Then the second point I wanted to make about this whole notion of the three different platforms that has bothered me. In fact, it has bothered me so much that I did a conference presentation on it uh, two weekends ago uh, at a state conference. And that is the assumptions that we make about what students understand as they navigate and negotiate different spaces for learning the homework space, the hybrid space, the face-to-face -face space, right? So we tell them, do this here, and then we'll do this here. But what my question has been is, do they understand the relationship between those different spaces and how one should play off of or feed into the other? That's been my big concern. And, you know, in the instructional planning process, we know what's in our head. We see all of the connections that are being made in the design of a learning experience, in the design of our course, et cetera. But I'm not so sure that those are made explicit and understood by our students. So in the absence of us thinking out loud to say, okay, I'm gonna have you do this at home so that when we get to class, we can do this. In the absence of that sort of uh, metacognitive you know, uh, input, do students really see those relationships? And I apologize if I'm grandstanding here, but I, I think that this is something that's really kind of a soapbox for me. And, and I just love to know everybody else's thoughts. Like, do, do you see, because I, I see it all the time, students getting caught um, between the platforms, as it were. Well, I think um, to, to answer, to, I, I think that's some great questions you raised, Bobby. And I think, you know, one of the things I'm in a unique position with regard to the, the the first class I was sharing about is I do spend all day six to eight hours every Wednesday with this group of students and it's interesting to hear their comments things I would not hear if it was a completely online course and things that probably wouldn't be said or that I wouldn't be hearing if it were completely in, in classroom in class course and by that I mean not paying to you know to to do all this i'm paying and the expectation is i'm paying this tuition money to be spoon fed not to have to go look at this website and come up with a list of community resources or to develop this educational um uh, program for for these patients so there does seem to be a disconnect i'm not really sure what the answer to that is for me i uh, repeatedly reinforce this is to help you gain practice with utilizing these skills or to take what you've learned in the classroom and understand how it relates to patient care. But I regularly have to remind them that it's not just busy work. It's not just um, that we're too lazy to want to, and we're deciding to make them look up all the information or do all the work. But I really see a lot of students, at least undergraduate, challenged to understand what active learning is and why we're asking them to do all these things. Yeah, and can I, if I can just interrupt real quickly, Meredith, and say, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I sadly, um, one of my colleagues, I think she had to drop out of this session. Um, in my department, we hear all the time because of the, the textbook and the, uh, the design of our um, elementary language courses here, we hear students say all the time, I feel like I'm teaching myself. You know, the same yes. thing that you just said, they're, they're upset because they have to accept some onus and responsibility for their learning. And so unfortunately um, that plays out in the evaluations at oh, the yes. end. And they say, why did I pay this money yes. to take this course when I have to do all this work? I feel yes. like I'm teaching myself. Yes. So it's, it's not just you, just to validate. You're, you're not the only one who's getting that. 
it's interesting to know uh it, I didn't necessarily think I was the only one, but I haven't actually had this conversation with anyone to find out are other people hearing that. It doesn't surprise me if they are, but it, it's still interesting just to hear other people's experiences with that. Yeah, I've, I actually was primed for that when I first started uh, doing active learning because I did a bunch of workshops and, and people warned me, oh, students will have this feedback and their way around it, which I have found at least keeps the students from, from giving me that comment, but I, I don't know if they still feel it in their heart of hearts. But um, I spend about half a class period in the first week motivating it, showing them results from research on active learning, on um, if I can, depending on the course, showing them statistics from, you know, before and after I implemented active learning in that specific course and, and saying, look how much better students did when they when they took responsibility for their own learning. And um, so that mo motivation for students as to like why we're doing it um, help, helps get some of them on board and I guess discourages dissent from the ones that aren't on board. I, I, I imagine there have to be some that are like, I don't care what the research says. I don't, I want you to just tell me what I need to know. But um, I, I feel like I haven't gotten as much pushback because I spend class time on talking about the why of how the class is set up, which goes back to some other comments people were making about explaining how and why their Canvas page is set up the way it is and, and things like that. One of the things that that I, I'm hoping we'll see when I get course evaluations, but I've started to do, particularly this semester, is really try to thread through this notion of what you just described, Angela, as the students are working on their preparation of their patient education. I, I was just last week, I was telling they asked me for my feedback on what they were thinking about doing. And I said, well, you know, people have responded very well in the past when folks have done the, um, and the students were thinking about a Jeopardy game or something like that. So I said, well, people tend to respond more when they're actively involved and they're not just sitting there listening and you're handing them a handout and that's all that they do. You get more out of it and you retain that information better. And I've repeatedly reinforced that idea, even when we go over the weekly self-assessments. So they complete the self-assessment quiz and it's due the Wednesday, the Tuesday before the clinical day, which is on a Wednesday. And then in clinical, I take a look at the quizzes prior to the clinical, actually. And in the clinical, I'll say, well, you know, I took a look at the quizzes across the uh, course, that, uh, across the section, there was a theme. About a third of the people missed item number one. Let's look at that and talk about that. What, what made you think that choice A was the answer instead of choice B? And then I'll try to come up with examples. Did you notice how in that group session we just came out of that the therapist said this in response to the patient's behavior? So I'll try to make that linkage with something that we have seen or done that day or recently in the hospital to try to help make that meaningful and also make them think that they're not just doing these weekly quizzes just to stay busy. But I've found that reinforcement, regular enforcement, this is to help you prepare for your exams. And I was encouraged because after the last exam, which was actually the first exam this semester in their didactic course, they said they felt like the quizzes had helped prepare them for the exam. So that was really nice to get to hear that feedback. Yeah, yeah I, sorry, oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this whole issue of uh, spoon fed versus finding, you know, I, I try to tell my students a couple of things. Well, first of all, I designed the course taking into account, as I talked about, the mixed preference, because it's very clear that some people like the lecture, but they like it not necessarily to be spoon fed, but because they benefit from taking notes themselves. That's what I was hearing. Um, so that's why I mix it. You know, the mix is half lecture, half activity, divided by day so that we're devoting a whole day to one thing and a whole day to another thing. But the other thing I do is I related to them 
my experience in, uh, when I lived in the UK and how they recruit people, because this is a business course, so they're interested in how companies recruit people. And I told them that in the UK, they don't care what your major was. And you know, so many students in the UK major in the classics and Greek literature, because their approach to education is you need to study something you love and you need to learn how to learn. So that's the lesson that I share with them, that a big part of university is learning how to learn. So, you know, that's why I try to get them over this reluctance to take on some learning by themselves and really teach them how to love how to learn. My take on that and my kind of one of the rationales and building upon what Barbara was just insightfully sharing. One of my rationales as I commented in the chat box is there's no way and I told the students this just recently there's no way you can know everything you will know and you will know well whatever area of nursing you specialize in. And it is impossible for me to tell you learn A, B, C, and D drugs that's what's going to be on the test, because there's no telling I mean there's common like SSRIs, a patient who's depressed is likely to be on a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but they may not be, depending upon whether other disease processes are present in that patient, that patient's unique response or lack of response to a medication. And you, you, you'll you know certain providers and what they tend to prescribe for patients, but then there's always, it's, it's impossible for me to be able to tell you, learn these 10 drugs, because that's what you're gonna see in practice. It, you're looking for something that's impossible to achieve and and that's what how we try to explain why related to medications because they complain about that a lot why we can't just tell you here's the list of what to memorize because that's what they're doing memorizing it's more than memorization yeah this has been a really really helpful discussion I'll say one more thing too about buy-in and I think a lot of it I know it's hard to scale for a larger class but Celia gave a great suggestion about having you know some uh, not canned that's not the right word but some pre-formulated responses based on what you know you're going to see with feedback but also trying to give that individually individualized feedback and Meredith mentioned this as well with the quizzes she was able to to speak to um, the student performance almost immediately. And, and that's what I try to do with my feedback of, of um, you know, recorded deliveries from the students is to let them know, like, I'm watching what the, the projects that you're turning in and, and just tailoring that feedback to the students helps them understand that if you are trying to partner with them on this learning journey, like they're doing a lot of the work, but you're there to give that feedback and that attention and, the, and to, uh, they can see kind of that individualized feedback approach that helps with buy-in as well to a lot of these um, exercises and activities. And I'm not even building on what you shared, Mandy. I think that's a great point. And one of the things I've become concerned about over the past, say, 10 years is not wanting students to think, particularly because it's an async, if it's an asynchronous daily delivered course online, um, even with hybrid, when I do have time with them in person, I don't want them to ever think, it's just on autopilot that I'm not reading. So I do, like Mandy says, I'll offer comments, individualized comments. And then I'll also, in a weekly summary that I provide via announcements, these are some of the things people mentioned across the discussion boards. So I, I want them to know that I am reading those. I don't have the time and the energy to provide an individualized response to every person's post, but I am reading those. So it's not a place just to goof off. I don't see any more things in the chat box. Anybody else? I'll unshare this document, but we're glad to provide copies if anybody wants this. We have about 10 minutes left, so there's plenty of time if there are questions or comments or considerations to. Meredith, this might be very specific. Hi, I'm Candace. I um, teach in the School of Social Work and Graduate Program, and I do some clinical practice. Where are you finding, if you don't mind sharing, good clinical video examples to pull from? Um, I haven't found. I haven't found them just from one place, one particular okay. place. Um, 
I've, I usually I'll do a search of whatever the topic is. And one of the one, one of the ones that I've got at the beginning of the semester is therapeutic communication techniques. And I, I think that's what I Google searched and I looked for videos and I found some really cute videos. A couple of them were um, examples that students from other programs had developed and they'll do a little scenario where they're, they're responding untherapeutically to the patient and then they'll have the same scenario with a different response. Um, I'm glad if you want to take a look at anything in this particular course, since you're, I love social work, I, I loved working <laughs> with social workers and home health. Um, but I'll e email me if you have an interest, you're welcome to, I'm in the teaching, observing teachers, the top program, I, teachers, observing peers, I think is what it stands for. And I've had people in that course before, and you can see the videos and how I have put them in. If, if any of those are relevant to you as a social worker, you are more than welcome to lift them from my course. But um, that, and I'd have to look at the URL to tell where I found those, but I, I know I Googled whatever the topic was for the week that we were talking about and just happened upon them. But I did find some good ones. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank sure. you. I've been doing a lot of Googling too, and I just want to, yeah, yeah. So that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I am posting right now a link to the teaching, the Teachers Observing Peers program from the CTL into the chat. Uh, there have been a lot of great resources that I've heard. This has been really insightful for me. Uh, I am super, super happy and proud to see that these types of conversations are going on uh, on campus, around campus, because it, it, active learning is so critically important. Um, we do have about eight minutes. I'm going to go ahead and close the, the recording just for the, you know, for the sake of time. If you would like to leave, you're welcome to. We're a little early, but if you want to hang out, I'm sure we can hang out for another uh, eight minutes or so and, and, and keep having this good conversation because it's been really robust. So on behalf of the Center for Teaching and Learning and the Active Learning Academy, I wanted to just tell you all thank you so much for attending and thank you so much to our session uh, presenters for the, the, the great information and uh, really insightful uh, work that you've done here. Thank you. Thank you for all the attendees. You were great. Great conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.